My name is Rodney Hull, uh, and I'm going uh, to make a, a presentation today uh, on a, a, a subject that's not very much used anymore. It's a trial of a, of a contested will case. Um, and uh, just to review the facts very briefly, uh, a lady died. She was 86 years of age. She was, she was living with her, her daughter, who was a faithful uh, uh, person who well, was a school teacher, retired from, from school teaching when she was about 40, gave up her pension, her income to look after her mother, who was in failing health. <clears throat> now, the time that they spent together uh, was rewarding for the, for the mother, and she was quite happy living with the daughter, but she continued to uh, enjoy poorer and poorer health as, as, the, as the years went on, and uh, came to a point where there was some real question as to how the daughter could maintain her in uh, some kind of a meaningful way in the home because of the medical condition. Uh, there was one other child of the marriage, and uh, he was, I suppose you might call a, a roustabout. He was a restless ne'er-do-well man who seemed to enjoy doing uh, not very much in the way of work and not contributing very much to his family. He was married to a, a, a medical technician who earned approximately $65,000 a year. The mother, who was is the deceased, had investments which yielded about $24,000 a year. She had a usual pension, old age, but no CPP because, well, she, she, she worked most of her life uh, as a seamstress. Uh, apparently that wasn't deducted or there, there, there never was any, any kind of an account. The house um, uh, is worth about $600,000. It's in a middle-class neighborhood in Toronto. And um, the, as I said, the mother, who is 86, uh, has... Uh, has those assets. Um, it turns out that uh, she has a will. She left her estate virtually to her daughter. Uh, the son was not mentioned in the will. Uh, the reason being as some kind of a, an arrangement that uh, is alleged by the daughter whereby the mother said, look, you look after me and I'll look after you and uh, you'll never have anything to worry about. Uh, that, that agreement was never, never reduced to writing or never made very formal. Um, and uh, one of the problems with that, as far as the evidence is concerned in the case, is Section 13 of the Evidence Act, which uh, requires that there be corroboration uh, when claims are, are asserted or evidence is asserted against an estate. And uh, there appears to be no corroboration whatsoever. The uh, the son uh, is uh, was it became very agitated about the fact that he got nothing, and uh, he didn't become aware of this until sometime very close to the end of the of his mother's life, when uh, the uh, the dutiful daughter had gone away for five days to a a, a meeting with some of her former school teacher friends in in Halifax, and uh, he. He apparently dropped in on his mother. Uh, he, uh, he usually did drop in on his mother about once a, once a month, and he picked up a thousand bucks here and there uh, when he did that, uh, supposedly to be, to be used for his children. Of course, the, the sister doesn't think he spent it on the children, but that probably just arises because of, as a result of the sibling rivalry that apparently uh, pursued them through their lives. Uh, the son when, uh, was was told then, when the daughter wasn't there, that he uh, that she had been uh, that, that the mother had been su suggested that she go to a nursing home, uh, and this upset the mother terribly, and uh, it's um, uh, it, it, it was bothering her. She told the son. The son said that he thought that his sister ought to be able to look after the mother. She wasn't that sick, and. Uh, but uh, he'd take her to, to a lawyer to, to get her uh, get her rights explained to her. Uh, he took her to his lawyer, Solicitor S. in this particular instance, and Solicitor S. Uh, advised uh, that she should have a will, and she said she had a will, and she left it all to the daughter. 
is very much agitated. The son, they had uh, conferences with the lawyer, the son and the daughter, and then the mother, but uh, not the daughter. And um, the son suggested that a fair disposition of the estate would be one-third to the, to the daughter, one-third to him, and one-third to his two children. Uh, doesn't sound like a bad deal to me. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it um, certainly uh, indicated some kind of uh, persuasion on his part. Not, not that persuasion isn't allowed. You're allowed to persuade people to what to do with their, 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 their estate, but you can't unduly influence them. And uh, the, the mother, who was, who was questionably competent, uh, agreed that that was a fair deal, and, and uh, they, they drew the will on that basis, and the will was executed. Now, I get into some of the details, and uh, and this, uh, this these facts are not intended to uh, wor- have be a worry as to who wins this case. Uh, it's a very close case, as you can see, and I'm not interested in who wins or what comments are uh, uh, pertinent to, to winning. What I do want to do is sh- show how I think I would present this case and how I would defend it. Uh, the, the question of, 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 of the presentation of the case, of course, we've got to have witnesses. And some of the, the most difficult, that, that, that to me is the most difficult case, part of any, any trial, and that is getting the witnesses. There. The lay witnesses um, usually are not a problem because if they, if they appear to be a problem, you can subpoena them and give them the 50 bucks or whatever they get these days. And uh, they are required to come, and if they don't come, then they're in some trouble, and they are told they can be told that. It's the medical evidence that is difficult to uh, marshal at a time when you want that evidence to go in. The um, uh, Doctor F, or Doctor, sorry, Doctor Z, here um, was the general practitioner. Now, general practitioners are usually book solid from morning till night, and uh, they see up to 65 to 70 patients a day. And uh, so that if you interrupt their practice for a day, then they've lost 65 patients. Our 65 patients are inconvenienced. 65 patients' uh, income is, is, is lost. Uh, what, you, what you do as far as, as, far as getting the uh, doctor said there, it's a very delicate situation. Dr. Z doesn't want to talk to secretaries or assistants or clerks. He probably wants to talk to you. Uh, Dr. Z will tell you the terrible time he has on, on the, for the next two weeks. He's booked solid. and uh, it's, it's a very difficult thing to persuade Dr. Z that he should come and give evidence because uh, if Dr. Z has any idea as to what a doctor goes through when he's called to give to give, give evidence, they usually have to wait around for about half a day, and uh, uh, so you sometimes have to compromise that problem with the very serious problem as to the sequence of the evidence. Um, we've got two gerontologists here, one on each side, barely on each side, and we've got Doctor Z. Uh, the problem with uh, with with that is that. Uh, it would be very nice to call these doctors in the sequence which I have, uh, which I have indicated to you. Uh, the serious problem is that uh, gerontologist one is going to Florida on uh, on uh, uh, next Thursday at a convention, and uh, and gerontologist two is is uh, doing something that's very important, and Doctor Z is booked solid, so. Uh, it's a very serious problem, and frequently you have to call these witnesses out of order, which, from my way of thinking, is a very, very difficult problem for you. And um, how you get the, the doctors down there, uh, sometimes they just say, well, you, you're going to, you know, I'm not coming. I, I'm too busy. I can't do it. You, you give me a day, and I'll, 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 I'll look at it and see what I can do. Well, sometimes you might have to subpoena that doctor. And you have to give them extra money for that. Not very much for a doctor. And uh, uh, if that's the case, you probably will lose that uh, that doctor 
as a friendly witness the next time you you go around, if you ever have to go around. Uh, we have, uh, this firm has for about the last 30 years dealt with Dr. Ken Shulman, a psychiatrist uh, of, uh, of very, very high high, high rank in, in, as a gerontologist. Uh, for my money, he goes out of his way to accommodate counsel. Uh, he gives evidence frequently, and uh, I would not want to uh, injure any relationship that I have or we have with, with him. And so you have to be very careful because uh, you have to accommodate them to the best of your ability. Um, uh, also, you will find that, uh, that uh, the doctors will uh, uh, provide you with a curriculum vitae, which is pretty important to have uh, in court. Uh, I don't think anybody, any counsel would ever consider uh, challenging a doctor as, as a professional man or something of that order, but you don't want to have to go through uh, his qualifications. You don't want to have to tell him when he graduated, where he hired or, or, or he was an intern, what what uh, other training he had. And, and uh, if, you, if you present it to the court, then first of all, nobody will look at it. But um, uh, secondly, it's it's, it's done. It's, he's qualified. And there's no question as, as to his qualifications. Now, starting the trial itself, um, also, of course, we have the, the lay witnesses. The lay witness I've mentioned that can be dealt with. Uh, but uh, starting the trial, uh, you can't, or you certainly, as far as I know, get a very good estimate as to when that trial is going to start, say within in half a day or a day. That, of course, is very important because uh, you don't mind seeing some of the lay witnesses sitting around. Um, the other witnesses, the time is very important to them. And, and so it is that uh, um, it's, 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 it's got to be a problem uh, because the, the judges aren't ready or the, 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 the less the case ahead takes longer or take less and less time. And, and uh, all those things have to be taken into account. Uh, as to, just, it, it would be nice if we could say it starts at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Sometimes you get that, uh, but you usually don't hear that till the night before. Now, the, first of all, the, when the case starts, the judge, of course, will ask you to call your first witness, and uh, and that's when the preliminary skirmish starts. Um, you point out to the court that you... Uh, um, uh, aren't certain as to as to what what, who, what witnesses are coming because Mr. So and So wouldn't tell you who he was going to call. And of course, the judge, being an old lawyer, probably uh, an old counsel, probably says, "Well, who the hell ever tells anybody anything?" Uh, and on the other hand, there is a there used to be a rule that said you had to disclose the names and addresses of your witnesses and the, and the, with a short comment as to their uh, uh, as to the evidence they're going to give. I don't think that that rule exists any longer because. Uh, I had two of us. Two of us were looking yesterday, and we couldn't find it. Um, I'm not certain, uh, but I know it, it, there was a time, and it, it was a rule that was that was never never followed. Uh, and people never gave that up uh, for some reason, and uh, uh, it's very important that, that, that you start on the right foot. Now, often in, when you start, if you're if you're putting forward the will, if you're the if you're the uh, propounder of the will. Of course, we all know in this room that uh, that uh, you're the plaintiff. Uh, the person is challenging the will, and who really uh, is viewed by everybody as the as the troublemaker, as the starter, as, as, is not in fact the plaintiff. And uh, sometimes you can have um, uh, you, you will not be surprised to know that some lawyers will say, "Well, you know, you call your first witness. You're you're, you're the you're you're the." And you're challenging this. Well, you tell me what's, what's wrong. Well, that's not the way it goes. It's not like a motor car accident. We're talking about uh, a will case. And the difference between a will's case and, and other cases, basically, is that the judgment that's given by the judge is what we call a just judgment in rem. In other words, it's good against the world. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it isn't just between the parties. It's against the whole world, and it's and it's enforceable at the suit of anyone at the, at, in in the, in the world. So uh, it's once the judgment is given, 
it's a will, and that's all there is to it. And uh, we can fool around with interpretations and things like that. But basically, if it's a if it's a will, it's enforceable. Um, the uh, uh, so it is that you will have sometimes encounter difficulty with people not knowing where the onus lies. The onus, as I said, uh, strictly speaking, I suppose you could say the onus on if if, if uh, undue influence is uh, alleged, the onus would be on the person alleging undue influence. Uh, the two issues uh, just get mixed up; they they get melded together. And, and the, the, the court will, will be on the basis that you're the plaintiff if, if you're propounding the will. And uh, the other person, uh, nice question as to, as to, uh, as to how you uh, uh, get around the, uh, the common practice of, of uh, thinking this in terms of a counterclaim, uh, the, a new influence being the plaintiff by counterclaim. Uh, that doesn't happen. The whole, as a rule, the whole Evidence goes in, and it's uh, all rolled up in a ball of wax, as I once said. And um, uh, that is how it starts. And um, uh, calling the witnesses, the first witness, of course, would, would be the, the lawyer who drew the will. Uh, because the first thing you want to do is establish that the technicalities have been uh, properly attended to. And uh, uh, he will... Uh, that, that solicitor who prepared the will will, will 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 come now. If you're if you're calling him as a witness, and if you're having difficulty with that, getting the evidence out that you want, um, you can, Chris, strictly speaking, you can cross-examine your own witness because he's really not your witness. He's a witness of the court, and uh, it's been held. Uh, for many years, that, uh, that it's, you are entitled to cross-examine uh, attesting witnesses. It's not. It's it's a, it's a concept that's not very well known. <clears throat> On the other hand, it's a it's uh, it can be very difficult for you if you are having trouble and you have to do it. I guess you have to do it. But it's a good thing to woodshed your your, your witness so that you know he knows exactly what you want what you want to hear. And uh, without distorting the truth, of course, I'm bending it a bit, maybe, but uh, not to any great extent. So we have to have to think about that. It's it's not an easy uh, it, 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 it's not an easy thing, but I can't emphasize too much the importance of, of having the attesting witnesses absolutely certain in their minds as to what they did. And if they uh, if they don't know, then you better give them uh, an idea as to what. It can be said in the circumstances. For example, uh, if you if, if if you witnessed a, a, a will forty years ago or thirty five years ago, <clears throat> you're not going to remember really uh, who signed first, whether the testator signed first, or you signed second, and the witness below signed third, which you would think is a natural thing. Um, and of course, there's a doctrine that says that uh, a law called. Uh, uh, there, there's a presumption that the, the document was properly executed if it, on its face, appears to be properly executed. Uh, and that's helpful when, when we're talking about ancient history and, and, and difficulties in proving the will. Uh, the solicitor in this case is uh, uh, not very uh, not very careful as to complying with the rules. He has no notes for one thing, and um, he um, remembers the, uh, the the situation quite clearly. He uh, he will state vigorously that it's his invariable practice to have two witnesses sign the will, sign, uh, witness the testator's signature. Well, that's fine, but it's not good enough for the Succession Law Reform Act uh, if you have to remember that all of the witnesses have to be there at the same time. And 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 see and be able to see the others sign at the time that the signatures are 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 are, are, are put on the will. It frequently happens that the lawyer will be there with the client. The lawyer will then say, "Well, it's after he's explained the will, he probably will say, oh, well, let's, let's okay, now, now we can sign the will.'" And in the meantime, he picks up the phone and, in this case, talks to the secretary and asks. Uh, 
and, and, and leave the message that she's to come in and, and, and be a witness to the will. Well, frequently uh, it happens, and it happens in a lot of times. It, 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 people take some comfort from the fact that uh, there is a provision that says that you can acknowledge a signature. Uh, well, you really can't, technically speaking. Uh, you have to, uh, you have to have uh, seen it happen. Uh, there's uh, uh, a lot of room there to cross-examine the solicitor. First of all, you can beat him up a bit because he didn't have any notes, and secondly, he was the solicitor. He was the the, uh, the lawyer for the son. He didn't uh, he didn't uh, exclude the son from the conference. Uh, he did a lot of things that he probably shouldn't have done if he was acting professionally and uh, uh, doing the job he should be doing as 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 a lawyer. He's uh, of course uh, vulnerable as well because in this case you can see that the secretary was asked to go into his office by someone while she was on a phone uh, arranging a closing for a real estate deal. Well, we don't know just how long that period was, and um, um, once again, you can you can you can have uh, you can gain some ground there if you're trying to uh, to uh, to show the court that it wasn't properly executed. And the secretary then will come in and give evidence that she that she. Uh, uh, Signed the will and saw the, the, the testator, and and she was a second witness, and she will say that Mr. So and So always has two witnesses to the wills, and he has has me sign them, and I've signed hundreds for him, and uh, uh, it doesn't speak well for his wills box, I can tell you in the future, but uh, it's uh, it's a, it's it's a problem you have, and one of the one of the things about it isn't so much that you you will succeed in your in your in your uh, endeavor to to show that the will wasn't properly executed. But you, you, you can shake up these, these witnesses because uh, there is that hiatus in time when the three people were not there together. And uh, it does. It, it'll shake up the lawyer. It'll shake up the, uh, the assistant, the legal assistant that did it. And uh, they might say something that uh, is helpful. And uh, uh, it's just something to remember that Vulnerability of, of witnesses signing wills is, uh, is 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 a very fair, proper, and uh, sometimes a very lucrative part of uh, of uh, your case in, in cross examining, and also in examination in chief. As I say before, you can't be more care too careful with these witnesses to explain to them that they've got to be there and and to be able to see what the time that the that the um, uh, will was signed. There's a very famous old case in which a, uh, <coughs> a person was uh, called in to, to witness a will, and, and uh, she happened to be uh, a, a client of the of the lawyer, and she was uh, she was just leaving, and he the lawyer asked her if she would stay and be a witness to the will, and she said that uh, that she wouldn't. She signed the will when the witness wasn't when the testator wasn't there, uh, and and and. Uh, the uh, apparently she left, got into her carriage, and um, uh, just as the testator was signing the will with the solicitor, uh, the, the horse lurched backwards. The lady was lifted up to the window and was able to see what happened. And she didn't realize what was happening, but that's 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 an old case and it's kind of a funny one. But um, uh, you got to be there. Now we are talking about. Uh, I think that the most important uh, aspect of, of the whole thing is to shake people up because uh, at this uh, witness uh, thing, because frequently you'll find that that's when the court will say, "Well, I'm, I'm, it's time for coffee and and uh, time for a break, and uh, maybe you two should be thinking about uh, uh, about uh, settling this case." And, and and it gives people a good reason to settle because they they're unsettled and uh, uh, they. Uh, they may, uh, uh, you know, you you may say, well, you know, you, you know what I mean. Uh, you have a little chat between the two lawyers, and uh, sometimes something fruitful will occur. Now, the next witness is is, um, is uh, the neighbors, the two neighbors, neighbor one and neighbor two, and they're called 
to give evidence as to verify the fact that there was some testamentary capacity in this this nice old lady that that walked around the block for three or four months and nodded her head to them. And you will find that that lay evidence of testamentary capacity really doesn't have much of an effect on a judge as a rule. If there's a very close relationship and if you can say, well, oh, yes, I was talking to her. We spent half an hour talking to each other every week or so. And she was very interested in how the Tommy police were doing and went on and on about the tsunami in Africa. And basically, we discussed everything that was happening around us. That's good evidence. That's very good evidence and very persuasive evidence. The kind of evidence we have here, which is the kind of evidence that you can expect because people if people are reluctant to come to court to give evidence on testamentary capacity, they don't know what kind of a box they're getting themselves into. They will know that the son is is trying to get them to say one thing and the daughter wants them to say something else. And they probably have some kind of a nodding acquaintance with each of them. And they're not going to want to upset for what they see is to be no reason at all of some perfectly decent relationship, however, however distant it may be with these people. And so it is that unless you have something very, very, very concrete from the lay witnesses, then you've got to put them in. But you'd be very careful when you when you when you put through the evidence in chief that you don't leave leave a space open for the opposing counsel to cross examine and make some some points. As I say, they the best way to deal with them is to is to tell them when the trials when you when you when you're going to need them and tell them that, look, I have to as a as a as a precaution, I have to have you serve with a subpoena. Don't worry, I'll call you and tell you when we want want you. But it's my duty to have you subpoenaed. And they can understand that professional witnesses can't. And so it is that with with the with the 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 neighbors that give evidence on just sort of a passing acquaintance basis are not much use. The 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 minister here who was a retired or the minister who was separated from his wife gives pretty clear evidence that that he he felt. But but once again, it's it's pretty wishy washy evidence. But I would think if I was a judge, I would want to hear from him more than the others and give his evidence a little more credence than the other way witnesses. Now, then we we come to the gerontologist one. The gerontologist one is 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 called. Now, I want to deal with Dr. Zed now, not with his evidence, but with some of the problems we have with Dr. Zed. Dr. Zed says that he doesn't think on balance that she knew what she was doing. Once again, pretty, pretty weak evidence of testamentary capacity, but it's of some evidence and very useful. So now if you're putting forward the will and you've had a conference with Dr. Zed, you've never examined Dr. Zed because the courts won't let you. The court wouldn't let him in this case. And so Dr. Zed is is a is is a very serious problem you have to deal with if you're putting in the evidence for the will, because the first thing the judge is going to say, well, why didn't you call Dr. Zed before the gerontologist? And you've got to say, you know, thanks, judge, for helping me, but don't lose my case. That's a problem we have because I would not call Dr. Zed in these circumstances if I was propounding the will. I know I can soften him up. I know I can I know I can make him go very wishy washy in chief, but I can do a much better job if I have him in cross examination. The other side you can bet is going to call Dr. Zed because Dr. Zed is going to say on balance he didn't think she had it. Well, I take that chance because you're going to make you're going to make far, far better chance 
of discrediting Dr. Z or, 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 or clouding the judge's mind with, uh, with the problem of testamentary capacity if you're able to cross-examine Dr. Z. Uh, well, now, and I, as far as Dr. Z's concerned, he appears to be a guy of about my age or, or, uh, or younger. And uh, in those days, in medical schools, they didn't teach them anything about psychiatry. They didn't know about the mini mental tests. They didn't have them. And there's some very sophisticated tests now which, uh, which permit doctors to come up with some kind of an opinion as to a person's mentality or capacity to, to, to make decisions for themselves and to be able to withstand the blandishments of people that are trying to get something from them. Uh, basically, psychiatry is not a big, it, it's, it's not a big problem. Or, not a big concern of the medical schools during the uh, during the uh, uh, education process. It's sort of like uh, oh, something like patents and trademarks is to the law now. It's a it's a big deal if you get out there in the uh, intellectual property area and uh, and very very sophisticated and very 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 deep subject. But it's not mentioned in the in the law schools very much. You might get a very peripheral sort of a treatment on a, on a case. Maybe it's some kind of a bird course that, that you can take and pick your averages up a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but by and large, test, testamentary capacity, psychiatry are, are, are not a big deal in law school. And so it is. You can you can get around this this doctor a little better because he probably doesn't know as much about psychiatry and, and, and senile dementia as you do. If, you, if you've been around, um, uh, we know, for example, that that uh, uh, one of the indicia of, of uh, dementia and, and uh, Alzheimer's is uh, uh, an ability to, to recognize what happened 30 years ago, but an inability to remember when you put butter in your toast this morning. Uh, it's uh, the kind of thing that uh, uh, it's nice to have, and it's a it's um, a tool that we have. I don't know how long we're going to have it because I think that medical schools are now getting getting on to uh, uh, dealing with the psychiatric evidence and uh, and, ger and gerontology and and all that thing because of, of the many specialties that uh, that uh, arise. Um, so that's just something to remember. And um, let's just say that we made a conscious decision not to call Doctor Z and we called gerontologist one who says that on balance I think she knew what she was doing. Um, he really just uh, says that. Now, you've got a problem <clears throat> cross-examining gerontologist one if you don't call Dr. Z, because you, it's, it's, it, it's pretty hard. You're certainly telling everybody you're gambling on being able to get some marks by cross-examining Dr. Z, because you present Dr. gerontologist one with, with Dr. Z's uh, uh, opinion. Now, um, so you could, com you could complain that, uh, uh, there's, you can't present that because it should come through Dr. Z. Uh, in that case, the judge will say, well, okay, we'll call Dr. Z. Well, you don't want to call Dr. Z. So. But usually, you just you put his, his report in, and uh, you will cross-examine and say, well, um, uh, uh, certainly the, the, the son's lawyer will say, well, uh, I've got your report, gerontologist one. Uh, I don't have much to add to uh, uh, would you please just uh, uh, look at your report, and we'll file your report, and it says that unbalance is consistent. Now, there isn't very much that can be cross-examined on on that uh, particular area. You might be able to say, uh, well, um, uh, you realize, do you, doctor, that uh, the uh, attending physician of this lady uh, will give evidence that uh, that uh, you uh, there, there's uh, there, there, there there was a lack of testamentary capacity. <clears throat> now everybody will fly off the handle at the, at, at the court, the table will tip over, the books will fall on the floor, and uh, objections will be made as to whether or not you can ask that question, and, and where's Dr. Z and all the rest of it. Um, it's not an easy obstacle to overcome, but uh, you're best to leave gerontologist one alone, I think, in this situation. He's given pretty wishy-washy evidence, and uh, uh, let's see what you can do uh, uh, later on uh, when you have Dr. Z on the stand and, and, and also gerontologist too who will support you. 
uh, as I say, gerontologist one probably would be a specialist, a psychiatric specialist in gerontology. Uh, geriatrics is the is the is the is the big topic of the day in uh, psychiatry at the moment, and Dr. Showman seems to be leading the pack in that area at the present time. Um, the next uh, witness, and that's 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 the end of your of, of your case. I, uh, I I neglected to speak about the evidence of the sun here, uh, uh, and, and basically the sun is is, is a, he's a very bitter man uh, about this because uh, he obviously his mother was hoodwinked. He thinks his mother was hoodwinked by the daughter, uh, and but he's a he's 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 a, he's a you know he's a rambling uh, rambling wreck from Georgia Tech. That's what he is. He's uh, he has uh, he has ideas about doing things, and uh, as I say, he had very he, uh, he had entrepreneurial wishes that, that never worked out. And um, uh, but but I think you have to go fairly easy on him because he doesn't appear to me to be particularly vindictive uh, toward the daughter. So you'd be very careful, I think, to to go along with him because he's going to say, "Well, look, yeah, I know, I wasn't much of a success." I I didn't get through high school. I took a little bit of an electrician's course, and I didn't fail that. And uh, um, I uh, look after my children. My wife uh, loves me. My children love me. Uh, I don't make a lot of money, and uh, but uh, I'm getting by, and, and life seems to be okay. Now, if he takes that position, I don't know what you can do to to cut him up uh, because uh, he uh, didn't keep sure. You can you can go around and say, well, you only came around once a month or so, didn't you? See your mother, and you knew she was sick, and, and and every time you went, you walked out of there with a thousand bucks, didn't you? Well, yeah, uh, I did, and uh, uh, I needed it for my children. Now, you, you don't want to have to swallow that one, uh, but that's the kind of way you're going to have to get to deal with him because you're going to have to let him have his way. He doesn't really know anything. Uh, he's not helpful in any way, really. Now, uh, on the other hand, when the daughter starts her case. She um, is uh, in a more desperate uh, way than the son. Uh, she is having her uh, her uh, livelihood challenged, basically. Um, although I would think that the judge might might take the fact that she has a pension starting in sixty five of about twenty thousand dollars a year. Uh, she probably will get pensions, uh, government pensions of. Ten to twelve thousand dollars. That takes her thirty-two thousand. She's going to get something from the one-third interest, so that probably take her in, her income up to forty-five, forty-five thousand, fifty thousand dollars a year, well above the uh, uh, well above the uh, uh, poverty level uh, for a single uh, senior citizen in Toronto, which today I believe is about thirty thousand uh, dollars, and um, uh, she is. She doesn't think that's enough, and, and, and I can tell you, as and my experience has been, as people grow older, they always think they're going to be broke before they're going to get to, uh, before they die, and, and uh, so that's why they, uh, the money sticks the fingers pretty 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 well these days. But uh, you're going to ask Ian about that. Uh, 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 she is she is a bitter lady. She uh, has never liked the son. There's been a great deal of sibling rivalry. Uh, you're liable to get the kind of evidence that uh, 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 the, uh, she'll say yes. Oh, he was he physically violent when I was young. He once bit bit my arm, and, and, and the teeth marks were there, and it broke the skin. And mother was so cross with him. And of course, he'll come back and reply and say, "I didn't bite her. She bit herself and told her mother." Uh, that's the kind of stuff you get into in this particular area. It's it's never very Clean. It's never very attractive uh, as a as a way of, of disposing of a problem, but that's what happens. Um, but the daughter will will certainly go out of her way to say that her mother her mother was was with the, with the fairies. Um, she looked after her. She 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 was with her 24 hours a day. She went to the doctors with her. She she shared with the doctor, but not the mother, the fact that the mother was in the ter terminal stage of cancer and uh, nothing could be done for her. And uh, that his daughter decided, with the advice of the doctor, that they wouldn't tell her that. And uh, 
uh, uh, she's uh, going to be dealt with favorably, I believe, by the judge as being a dutiful daughter, a, a person that does care, did care for her mother. On the other hand, uh, we know uh, that uh, she didn't like being a teacher, and she didn't like kids. So uh, looking after her mother was not as bad a prospect as, as one might expect in the circumstances. Um, we have uh, the two neighbors once again, uh, lay witnesses. I believe this is neighbor four. I believe is the is the minister. Um, I think uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. They're lay witnesses. I've dealt with lay witnesses um, previously, and uh, then we call Doctor Z. Now, Doctor Z, of course, is the witness for the daughter. The lawyer for the daughter, of course, is restricted in his ability to cross-examine and cross and, 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 and or to cross-examine her. There's there's no way that I know of that uh, that you can get a right to cross-examine your witness and, uh, unless, of course, they're hostile. But that uh, is not a, a situation that uh, could have, could apply here. Uh, Doctor Z is, is 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 he said on balance he thought she did not have testamentary capacity. And I think um, the thrust of examination in chief would be to say, well, uh, tell me, doctor, why did you come arrive at that conclusion? Uh, did you perform any mental tests? No, I didn't perform any mental tests, but I, I've known her for, for, for a number of years. I, uh, she always made sense when I spoke to her. She was had deteriorated, no question, but she, has, she was 86 years of age. She couldn't be expected to. To, uh, to have a, a very facile mind, and, and uh, uh, however, uh, I certainly think she knew enough that she uh, enough that she cared for her daughter, even though the daughter was was uh, uh, not as as kind as she might have been, because uh, uh, the uh, fact of the matter was that the daughter was getting at this stage in the in her life, she's getting a bit tired of trying to cope with the situation. Not that there was any bad feeling or anything of that nature. She was just frustrated because she couldn't look after her mother. And um, and that's when, uh, of course, the, uh, the problem arose with the, with the son. Uh, as far as Dr. Zed's concerned, he's your only hope. If you can turn him around a bit and get him to, to soften up what is already a very soft opinion, if you can soften that up further, might be able to suggest to the judge an argument that uh, you had proved uh, on a balance of probabilities that uh, she, uh, she, there's a very serious question here, judge, and you can't tell me on a balance of probabilities that she either knew what she was doing or she didn't know what she was doing. And that's a nice position to be in, uh, and that the only way you're going to get there is by cross-examining Dr. Z. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the next witness is gerontologist two. Gerontologist two will say on balance that she didn't know what she was doing. Uh, gerontologist two, if you're calling him in chief, really basically all you do is file his report and uh, say uh, the formalities of curriculum vitae, file the report, uh, state as best you can the best paragraph he's got in there that helps you, and uh, uh, can you tell me why you, what, what you base that uh, particular opinion, Doctor? Uh, well, while I never knew Mrs. Uh, So-and-so, uh, uh, the anecdotal evidence that I've been able to obtain from my conferences with uh, the son and the daughter and uh, uh, some of the witnesses would indicate to me that uh, she, she was not capable of managing her affairs. She, just, she, 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 she had crossed the threshold of... Uh, of testamentary capacity and was incapable, and uh, that's about all you can you can do get out of her in out of him in chief, him or her in chief, and uh, the only hope you've got is to cross examine him and, and point out the doctor doctor Z report um, and, and the gerontologist one report, and uh, uh, he's going to have to skate around gerontologist one and 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 uh, doctor Z, and he will. He will attempt to justify his opinion, and uh, a lot depends on how he says it and what he says as to what the judge is going to determine. And then uh, after that, uh, 
we've come to gerontologist. Juan is being recalled in, in reply, and uh, he's now, uh, he is now, uh, familiar with Dr. Zed's evidence and, uh, and, uh, gerontologist 2's evidence. And, uh, you can, uh, you can then, uh, ask him about uh, why he disagrees with Dr. Uh, gerontologist 2, and, uh, that's about all you can do with him. And, uh, if you're calling him in chief, you can, you can simply say, well, here's his, here's, here's gerontologist 2's report, which he's already seen, and say, gerontologist 1, uh, what comments would you have uh, in connection with this? We've also heard the evidence, or you heard the evidence when you were sitting in court, uh, that uh, gerontologist 2 was, was persuaded that she didn't have testamentary capacity. And then you can get on with him. And, of course, then you can... You can uh, you can argue the case now. There's a couple of there's a couple of rules of evidence that are not very well known uh, in this particular area. One is the uh, is the collateral evidence rule. Uh, frequently, you will find lawyers who uh, who are opposed to you attempting to discredit your witness. Uh, they all try and discredit your witness, but uh, this is a particular means of discrediting your witness by questions which have no bearing on the case at all. For example, if in this case uh, uh, one of the lay witnesses was uh, was being uh, examined and and uh, and uh, he, uh, the, the, the lawyer overheard them speaking to their to their friend who had come with them in in French, and um, you would say that you say if you, if you could elicit from that particular witness that some fact that she didn't speak French. You could, might say, "Well, but I heard you. Uh, I heard you speaking French in the, in the corridor," and uh, that's not admissible. The, 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 the judge will throw that out and uh, say it's a, a collateral evidence rule is that uh, you can't uh, you can't discredit that witness on that on that evidence because the evidence has nothing to do with the case. Uh, the other rule is a very important one is the rule of Brown and Dunn. I think most of you are familiar with that. It's a it's it's the rule that says if you if you uh, uh, want to cross-examine a witness on, uh, or if you want to call evidence to to challenge the evidence of a witness, uh, then in a certain respect, then you must have cross-examined him in that respect. You can't simply have a witness say, uh, uh, "I was on the train to Montreal and uh, I met so and so," and and. Uh, then uh, uh, not cross-examine him and, and call evidence to say that he wasn't on the train to Montreal. He was in the uh, he was in the uh, London City Council chambers or something. You can't call that evidence because because you didn't cross-examine him, even though it's a very vital uh, and important fact. Um, so you have to be aware of that. You can't just sit back in the bushes and and, and wait for these people to uh, to. Uh, uh, make a statement that, that you, you, you don't want them to make. Um, and I think that's pretty well all that I have to say. And I'm quite happy to uh, see what questions this this is it, 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 this might have raised with the people. Uh, <laughs> all right, we now turn to some question and answers, and we're going to start with Jordan Aiton. He has a question for Rodney. I mean, what would you do if you have um, a letter from the doctor, which you commonly get, that's a one-liner from the family doctor that says, I'm satisfied uh, Mrs. X had capacity, and, and that's the end of the letter? I think I would, uh, if, I was, if, if, he, if he was my witness and I was examining him in chief, uh, I would say, well, uh, this is your opinion, obviously, but uh, can you tell me, expand on this opinion, why, is, uh, on, on what basis do you, did you arrive at this conclusion? And uh, you have to, uh, be, you, you have to have spoken to the doctor before and told him you're going to ask him that question, and uh, he will give you an answer. Probably says, "Look, I knew her for years. I, I never any, never any question about testamentary capacity. No, I didn't, uh, didn't do a mini mental test. I, it never tells me much. I don't really understand it anyway." Um, that's the kind of a response you might get, and and uh, and if you want to get into it. Uh, uh, if you're trying to cross-examine them, you can, you can say, well, you know, neighbor one says that she walked around the block every once in a while and asked about her grandchildren, and she wasn't very pleased about that because she wasn't even married, and uh, that kind of uh, 
thing and you can confront him with that evidence and to see how he handles it. I remember the most effective most effective evidence I ever experienced from a doctor was a question put to to uh, to uh, to the doctor whereby somebody said, Well a doctor, just what do you think that she understood? And the doctor said I think she knew that she liked ice cream. Hmm. Uh, and that put an end to that guy's testimony because uh, nobody was going to go near that one. Uh, but uh, that was sometimes these short answers are the most effective that can be given. Sean, you have a question? Yeah, Rodney, when you're finished with the, the solicitor and the legal assistant, and if you're the challenger, and it's clear after that evidence, after you've cross-examined, that there is not compliance with the requirements for execution, uh, do you try to end the trial then and there, or do you want to continue with your other evidence? Uh, if it's if it's abundantly clear that there was there was no execution, no proper execution, I guess you could ask the judge to 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 make the finding at that time, and and it would be all over. But you, uh, the judge, in, 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 in all likelihood, would say. Well, I understand your your argument, and uh, I've heard it, and, and uh, but I want to hear the rest of the evidence so that I, so that if if, if my finding is that it, it was properly executed, then we can deal with the whole will. Uh, it must be a very rare case where you where you can't prove execution uh, to some extent. When I say the problems I've raised in this about the secretary coming in and seeing both witnesses on the paper probably not proper, um, it, uh, it certainly would be substantial compliance if we had uh, substantial compliance, but we don't have it. And what the, the problem with the execution part and the fact that we don't have substantial compliance is that the, the judges uh, bend over backwards to try and uh, justify the execution, such as in the Park Road Baptist Church uh, case, uh, uh, in which uh, uh, the court held that uh, the fact that the judge didn't sign uh, was okay, and there was just one witness, but he was there, and he saw what happened, and he signed later. And that, to my thinking, is a, a judge bending over backwards so far as to fall flat on his face myself, but it's a, it's a, it's a case that, you must remember, was never challenged, David. Eh? That, that case was never challenged. It was on consent. Well, not on consent. It was, no, 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 don't tell Tim Uden that uh, it was on consent, because it wasn't on consent. It was it was uh, just he, he submitted his rights to the court. And, uh, Craig, I understand you have a question for Rodney. Rodney, in the event that the daughter is unsuccessful in challenging the will, uh, she will no doubt want to uh, put forth a claim based on proprietary estoppel or quantum merit based on her care of the mother and the arrangement and or oral agreement that they had with respect to the care of the mother, uh, which may have included the actual uh, intended gift of an asset or uh, a monetary amount. Now, uh, in my experience, you can uh, deal with that as a separate trial, but in an effort to take care of uh, and uh, be as cost efficient as you can, uh, have the issue dealt with by way of a separate trial heard immediately after uh, the trial on the will, and therefore the same judge gets the opportunity to hear the same witnesses, deal with the same credibility issues, um, and hopefully deal with it in a uh, expeditious way. Is that something, or is that an approach that you would agree with, or do you have a comment on that? Uh, I would have to say that uh, I think it would be a rare judge who would hear them all together, uh, one after the other, uh, at the at the same time. And I think myself, it's a very good idea. Uh, I, I don't know that, that, technically speaking, the evidence of the uh, contested will case might be entirely different from the evidence that's given on the uh, on the uh, claim for compensation or quantum merit or proprietary estoppel. I don't think I think you would have to get the agreement of the other counsel uh, to proceed on that basis. It shouldn't be hard to get, but uh, if uh, if there's going to be a big difference in the evidence of uh, of the son and the daughter, uh, the son was you can see the son was was relatively laid back in this particular. Uh, Casey, he was very, yeah, very compliant with people's wishes and, and uh, readily admitted that he wasn't much of a guy and uh, um, he might want 
have entirely different different evidence given, and if if, if I if, if, if it could be argued before that judge that uh, that uh, you want to call all kinds of different evidence, and you don't think that the judge should be should be uh, uh, bound by the evidence in this case, and uh, he wants to hear it fine, but there may well be some evidence, and uh, and uh, that he he would have to ignore any evidence in the uh, the. Uh, claim for compensation case uh, that arose in the Wills case if there was a difference in the evidence. 